Greetings. My name is Juliana Boyle, and I'm your host today for our webinar, Health Reform and EMS, What Are the Innovations Needed to Thrive? This 90-minute webinar is presented by the Abros Group, a consulting firm that specializes in ambulatory care, emergency department, trauma, EMS planning, program implementation, and financial analytics. We have an excellent presentation for you today and are glad you've joined us. We have two nationally recognized speakers presenting today, Matt Zavadsky and Mike Williams. Good morning to both of you. We're looking forward to your presentation, but first let me quickly go over some housekeeping issues. You should be seeing our welcome slide on your screen. If not, please call our webinar provider, GoToWebinar, at 800-263-6317 and follow the prompts for technical support while in session. With respect to questions, please feel free to submit them anytime. To submit a question, type it in the designated questions area in the control panel and click Send to submit. We will answer questions over the audio system and not on the computer screen. Also, it would be helpful for you to include your city and state. Those questions that are not answered during the webinar will be answered via email, and a copy of the Q&A will be sent to everyone. You should have received an email packet of information about the webinar. Please have all participants complete an evaluation form and provide their contact information on the Excel file provided. Please email these forms back to us immediately following the webinar. If you did not receive these documents, please contact the Abros Group after the presentation. Finally, this webinar is being recorded. We hope to have it on our website free of charge, and I'll notify you when it's available. And remember, if you have technical support questions, call GoToWebinar at 800-263-6317 and follow the prompts for technical support while in session. Now let me tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Our first speaker is Mike Williams. Mike is the president of the Abras Group and has 30 plus years in the operation and design of emergency care systems. He is a specialist on health reform with respect to pre-hospital, outpatient and inpatient services, and on regional delivery systems at the safety net and traditional payer levels. He recently completed an assessment on health reform for the Sacramento, California region, assessing its impact on primary and emergency care services. Our other guest speaker today is Matt Zavodsky. Matt is the Public Affairs Director at MedStar Mobile Healthcare in Fort Worth, Texas. MedStar is the exclusive emergency and non-emergency EMS provider for Fort Worth and the 14 surrounding cities in North Texas. Matt has over 30 years of experience in the EMS field as well and has helped guide the implementation of several innovative partnerships with healthcare partners that have brought MedStar fully into the healthcare system. These include community health, congestive heart failure readmission reduction, observational admission reduction, hospice revocation avoidance, and a 911 nurse triage program. Now let's get started with the presentation. Mike, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much, Juliana, and um, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, Matt, as well. Um, I'm in sunny uh, Phoenix, Arizona today where they're expecting the temperature to rise to 78 or 79 degrees by the end of the weekend. So uh, I'm just wondering, is there not winter somewhere in this country? We sure appreciate having you all here today. Um, the, uh, this uh, webinar, there's quite a few of you on this uh, webinar which suggests to us that uh, this is a very important topic and there's a uh, not a whole bunch of information out there for EMS providers or other stakeholders relating to EMS providers across the country. I wanted to mention that um, uh, it's important that uh, we're able to, uh, I'm trying to get the slide to move forward, which I can do, I'm sure, if I can uh, get it to cooperate here. There we go. So this is what we have ahead of you here. Uh, I'm going to provide an overview of health reform uh, and uh, look at the impact in EMS providers. And then Matt's going to look at e advanced EMS strategies and some of the many experiences he's had both in the Fort Worth area but also now having uh, collaborated and discussed this, uh, uh, many of these concepts across the country. And then we'll be allowing for uh, questions and answers uh, near the end so you all get a chance to uh, provide your questions and answers in that chat box uh, 
or yeah, the chat box is listed to your right side. Well, first of all, I just want to you know talk a little bit about the basics of health reform, and and as you can see here, the uh, uh, the the problem that was being addressed across the country is really this this whole notion of uh, uh, of healthcare expenditures and. Uh, while all countries that have been surveyed have uh, seen an escalation of healthcare expenditures, the United States is really seeing a dramatic growth without uh, necessarily the uh, resultant re uh, increase in uh, yield as it relates to these expenditures, particularly in terms of lives, uh, number of years lived, and what have you. So we far exceed any other country, nationalized or excuse me, industrialized uh, country in the in the nation. In the world, excuse me. Uh, if we look at healthcare spending across the country, uh, there's tremendous differences. Uh, the darker red colors indicating the highest expenditures per Medicare beneficiary, and the lower being the lowest expenditures. And uh, when we look at this and overlay this on the uh, notion of uh, variations in quality of care, uh, this just happened to be diabetic uh, Medicare receiving appropriate management. Uh, the bang for the buck is not there, and, and there are many other indicators of this. But uh, And by the way, when we speak in terms of health care to many of my EMS partners uh, on this call, we think of uh, variation is, is not being acceptable. In the old days, we used to think of the art of medicine and the art of paramedicine or paramedic services and having some discretion and sort of you know being sensitive to individual patient needs. And while we don't want to lose that, anytime we think of the term variation, we think of that as a bad thing in healthcare. It's by and large it increases costs, and more importantly, it varies the care being rendered on similar types of patients and that by and large cannot be tolerated over time and that's a very big piece of what health reform is all about. Uh, now the other piece of course is that our uninsured rate has been growing dramatically across the country and it now uh, looks like it's you know pretty close to 50 million people across the country out of about 300 million. Uh, the uninsured rate uh, has risen you know a little bit higher here in the last couple of years to 16 percent of the population, but some states have higher rates of uninsured than others, and therefore a much more dramatic need. So we have this sort of uh, uh, you know convergence of really bad things. We have high expenditures, we have the lack of bang for the buck, so to speak, and then we have a large proportion of our population that's uninsured. It's just a it's not a sustainable situation over the long haul. So let's just talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act and some of the basics. Uh, this uh, Care Act, for example, uh, provides coverage expansion, and this is the biggest anchor. And a lot of people are misinformed or or just don't understand this provision that more people, a large percentage of our population that today is uninsured, will become insured as of uh, you know basically 11 months from now or something shortly thereafter. So it's not only about something in the future, it's something in our very near future. Uh, it will ensure that patients, uh, excuse me, people will have coverage when they need it. And, and by the way, uh, I, I'm actually misstated there because it, it, you know, when I use the word patients, that we think of how patients come to us, right? They become patients, and therefore they wouldn't even be in the EMS system if they weren't patients. But there's a whole other group out there that don't use services, but they eventually will need services, and that's the public or the people, so to speak. And so reform really addresses the people, not necessarily just the patients, eventually matriculating, uh, matriculating down to the patient. Payment reform and experiment experimentation will occur as well, and there will, there is clearly initiatives, and we'll talk about a few related to EMS, that incentivize efficiencies and quality improvement. That's all part of reform. And uh, prevention and community education is a big piece of the uh, Affordable Care Act, or otherwise called ACA. And then primary care capacity and infrastructure uh, uh, will be improved uh, primarily for the safety net patient, the previously safety net patient now becoming insured with some kind of a insurance product, and uh, that will address demand for newly insured people. So uh, that's primarily done through the community health network or the community health centers, or many of you think of these in, in some cases as free clinics that are going to be expanded dramatically across the country under the ACA. So how many uninsured are there? Well, right now it's just banking on 
about 15 million people, 16.3 percent. Uh, while we've seen some years of stability, and even in a one year recently of a slight drop, it's uh, it's a big number. Uh, but today, it's uh, has grown again, and. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, 10% uh, of the uninsured are children. And there are those that have said across the world that you know a nation's uh, character can be judged about how we treat our children. And so to have one out of every uninsured people, basically, or about 7.5 million people, excuse me, about uh, two, uh, that are uninsured that are children. This is uh, not a good message about the United States. We've also seen a concomitant uh, reduction in employer-sponsored insurance. And you go, oh, employer, what do you mean? Well, that's basically the people we work for. Do they insure us today, and do they not insure us? Uh, uh, and do they not insurance in the future? And so we've seen an erosion, particularly in small businesses, of people or businesses who can no longer afford to provide insurance, or in some cases cannot afford to provide the same type of insurance. And and the public is taking on more and more, or the employee, or in some cases not having insurance at all. Uh, and then the increase in public insurance. We think of this as primarily Medicaid, Medi-Cal, healthy families. Uh, the so-called underinsured. So uh, again, a challenge. Now, one thing about uninsured, if you talk about the uninsured across the nation, you need to really think about not what is the static number, but remember there are populations moving in and out of the uninsured ranks. And that has been anywhere close to about 85 million people between 1996 and 1999, the last time that was studied. So what does that mean? So people who become unemployed might for a period of time not have insurance. But maybe even during a given year, they might have on. They might not be insured, but they may be insured at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year. We still want to value that because that's a big number as well. And of course, uh, you know, becoming eligible for public programs, Medi-Cal, for example, in our state or Medicaid in many other states, is a month-by-month -month situation. Your eligibility can vary by month. And then you have life events, tragic emergencies, major traumatic events. Uh, uh, behavior health issues or what have you that can put you and tip you over from the insured to the uninsured rank because you've exhausted benefits uh, in the past or in fact uh, have no longer can afford insurance coverage. Again, it's been consistently 12 to 16 percent of the population, the uninsured rate, and uh, about 10 to 25 percent of the population that are underinsured. So uninsured versus uninsured. Again, thinking of uninsured as being the Medi-Cal, Medicaid, healthy families, and insurance coverage is below that. All right. So even with ACA, the Affordable Care Act, or the Accountable Care Act, costs are still a problem. Uh, assuming that physician cuts are prevented, which Medicare CMS pushes that every year, a big agenda for that, which really doesn't affect EMS providers, but it is a big issue for physicians. Um, spending will continue to increase at, you know, to today, I think it's recognized as un it's not sustainable level. So uh, the reform basically takes on some of this. Uh, median out-of-pocket expenses, uh, uh, spending as a share of Medi Medicare beneficiaries increased from 11.9% to 16%. That means our Medicare patients are, are paying more out of pocket than they were, say, 10 years ago, given uh, the 10-year period this study occurred. Medicare pays a smaller percentage of beneficiaries to health spending and typically large employer plans. And, um, you know, 74% against what a, uh, a typical benefit plan might pay 83 to 85%. So uh, we don't really expect Medicaid, Medicare to be the best payer, but already we know those costs are escalating beyond sustainable rates. And then um, just to put this on the table, with ACA, there's no, um, there's no expectation that Medicare will improve, uh, or excuse me, will increase coverage under ACA. It's mostly Medicaid or the underinsured, but Medicare is not expected to expand except for the aging population unrelated to ACA and the, and the statutes associated with ACA. There will be cuts in provider payments, we already know, through certain programs, and we do know that that's one of the other challenges that our industry is all concerned about. Every payer or every uh, provider is interested and concerned about potential cuts that might occur in our payment through Medicare that might affect our ability to survive as a function of 
being able to and needing to be able to pay for the uninsured in the future. There will be lots of experimentation, incentivize better care, and this is a topic, this term, accountable care organization, we'll talk about once again, uh, and looking at maybe paying some of these organizations that are physician, hospital paired, but why couldn't they include EMS providers as well, uh, and many other providers, and there being potential for being paid on a global basis with the whole goal of reducing readmissions and letting that accountable care organization decide how they allocate those dollars. So the question, of course, with EMS is are you going to be at the table for that? Are you at the table now? Or should you be at the table in the very near future? Because uh, there are another 108 of these, or excuse me, another 112 accountable care organizations were just announced last week by CMS. Uh, CMS is also spending $10 billion over the next 10 years for innovation projects under the uh, Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Grant Center. And again, we'll talk about some of the EMS innovations in just a moment. So uh, with respect to that, uh, we have four projects across the country that I think could be reasonably tied to EMS. Uh, these are grant funded uh, that began uh, basically last year, in the spring of last year. And these are all grants, amongst many others, are granted to hospitals and other uh, including accountable care organizations to design to reduce utilization and reduce uh, costs and provide better outcomes. So we do know in many of our environments that patients use services for a variety of reasons, particularly perceiving that they don't have another way or another uh, option available to them, and that drives patients to move in a direction that has excessive costs and is frequently, especially in the emergency care system, not well suited to solve the entire patient needs, maybe for the episode at hand, but not. So uh, REMSA, of course, in Reno has a, a very uh, strong community-based health worker uh, system uh, that is expected to lower uh, diseases, but it's tied to the uh, EMS delivery system as well, the, the REMSA system. Uh, Prosser Public Hospital in the state of Washington has a program that's a community paramedic program. And these are just abstracts, just short and abstracts. Uh, but look at these savings. We're talking about REMSA has provided um, an indication over three years would be about $10 million worth of savings, uh, although they're receiving close to $10 million. That's just in three years. So over time, uh, that expected to double or triple, and thus the initial investment and the learning lessons from that should be a big value. Here's a couple more. Here's University of Emergency Medical Services out of Buffalo, about a $2.5 million cost with a $6.1 million gain. And again, these were all competitive applications. Here again, they're deploying community health workers, but tying many of these uh, services to, uh, in this case, uh, a strong uh, uh, reduction, desire reduction of emergency department visits for patients that don't need to be there. And then you have the Upper San Juan Healthcare District in Colorado, which is the southern part of uh, Colorado, that will generate uh, an expect, expect, expectation of an $8.1 million. Remember, when these entities applied, amongst hundreds that applied, um, these numbers had to be very precise, and they had to show very rational calculations of how they were going to achieve these numbers, or they just weren't going to be funded. And a vehicle for achieving those fundings and being up and seeing some of those results in a short period of time. So uh, these are not necessarily go-to-bank numbers, but they're highly credible numbers and something we should be very optimistic about that somebody's out there foraging uh, for the future for us. So just looking at the safety net, I just want to mention that one of the big components of increasing the primary care network is really looking at community health centers or community centers or community clinics. And uh, there's $11 billion that's going to be spent over five years to double their patient uh, population served or their capacity served. And uh, so we do expect a large percentage of patients. And these health centers are very interested. I know from a lot of experience with working with them, they're very interested in the Medicaid patient. They like the Medicaid patient. They have a reimbursement system that's better than the hospitals and certainly better than the emergency departments. We do know that there will be a cut in the hospital spending uh, using the term that you may have heard before, DISH spending, which is a previously previous approach and how we help hospitals that have disproportionate shares of Medicaid patients, that is the uninsured patients, but that dish funding will go away largely because there will be a lot more insured patients and uh, that those cost savings will be
be used to help support the newly insured costs. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in states that don't take uh, the Medicaid expansion dollars uh, because, uh, you know, under the Supreme Court ruling, that's the only not so great win from the, uh, or that's the only non-win from the Supreme Court decision of last June. But otherwise, ACA is here to stay, and it's going to be rolled out, and then, frankly, many provisions have been rolled out already. And then finally, wellness and prevention is a very big push in wellness and prevention, and if you we're beginning to look at opportunities for EMS. You say, well, gee, there, there are certainly uh, teachable moments, uh, but there are other things to be done, uh, perhaps with some of the resources, sort of shifting our thinking away from episodic responses to maybe getting ahead of the power curve and looking at be before a response occurs, community education, what have you. Uh, so how do we prepare for the future of emergency care? And I just do want to mention that uh, this is uh, actually, uh, I, I stole this from Matt, this slide that really looks at uh, expenditure payments uh, and uh, you know where the dollars go. And as you can see, the hospitals get a big proportion of funding if you took every dollar. Uh, and then uh, this is for CMS type patients, which uh, would be Medicare and Medicaid, and 30% uh, basically is split between physicians and hospitals. But if you look at it, uh, we estimate that about one cent of every dollar spent for emergency department doesn't seem like a big deal, and probably close to 0.1 cent or uh, less than one cent for EMS. And, and again, you'd say we're a small part of the expenditure cost, but we're probably generating a large percentage of the cost for many of these patients. And why? Because once they get into the EMS delivery system, what do we have to do? We have to send everything, right? And once they get to an emergency department, there's a lot of expectation for diagnostic testing. And oh my gosh, what happens if we have to admit a patient that maybe if they had been handled earlier on in their event, they wouldn't need the admission, or even in some cases, because they're in the emergency department, the preference is to admit the patient. So here's what we know. We do not expect a dramatic growth of EMS responses with ACA. Let me repeat that again. We do not expect EMS responses to grow dramatically. Now, we say grow organically. Grow based on population increases and as an aging population, but not as a function of those that you know have you know, not sure, a large spike in growth as it relates to uh, EMS responses. The other area is the emergency department visits. We expect them to grow organically as well. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of misinformation about, gee, we're going to see these huge responses and huge need to build a lot more capacity in these areas. And it's just simply not true. Uh, again, we don't expect the trauma centers, so which is another area that we spend a lot of time in to grow any more than just organically. So where are, you know, we're going to have 39 million newly insured patients across the country by 2019, many of which will come on board on 2014. We do know that about 43% across the country will be Medicaid patients. And you say, well, gee, that's underinsured. We don't like that. But the fact of the matter is these are uninsured patients today. They do not have insurance. Uh, so uh, there are those that look at incremental costing and say, well, basically, in some form of payment is probably better than none. Uh, and then 57% will be insured by what I call an indemnity type product. And I mean that only in the very largest sense. It could be a managed care product or, or what we call them commercial products, probably a better term. You know, a Blue Cross, an Aetna, a Health Net, or a variety of other type of insurance. Very much like an insurance product that many of you have today. So a large percentage, close to 60% of the newly insured, will have really good insurance. And uh, that's not to say that there may be cutbacks in some of the insurance as they expect the provision of health care to improve including better accountability, uh, but the fact of the matter is there are going to be a lot more insured people. Uh, but there's a contralateral expectation or contrary expectation that cuts will occur primarily in Medicare of 716 million, or, uh, well actually it's 716, that's a type of billion dollars. So we have about an $800 billion cost to build health reform and about an $800 billion dollar in Medicare costs. That's a typo. It should say 716 billion dollars. 
But we know there's money out there, right? The Institute of Medicine back just this past September wrote a best practice, and we think of the Institute of Medicine and Healthcare as largely a very credible science and evidence-based uh, uh, institution, uh, uh, and and really a uh, a uh, strong indicator of of what's happening with our healthcare industry, and they already know that about 750 billion of our expenditures is wasted on unnecessary services, excessive administrative costs, fraud, and other problems. And of course, when you have some of this, it's going to cause unnecessary suffering and uh, some inefficiencies as well, including 75,000 uh, deaths that could have been inverted just looking at numbers from 2005. That's just in 2005 alone. So wow, those are big numbers. So we do know that if we start shaking the trees, or efficiencies that are available to us. But think about waste and think about where waste occurs in our industry and in other industries. Just looking at EMS, uh, you know, the notion that when, you know, with, with a relatively modest Q, a 911, what's your emergency, medical, we send everything, right? In some cases, we send more than everything. I work in communities now where, depending on what fire agencies there are, you might get a ladder, a truck, a supervisor, and that's just for the fire first response. And by and large, on the West Coast, that's going to be an ALS response plus the ambulance. Plus, depending on the event, you might get an ambulance supervisor. Holy cow, that's a lot. And, and we send everything to everything. And, and the thing is, uh, to anything, and so the problem, of course, there is uh, that means even the patient that you know, might have been able to be managed in a different care map, and Matt will talk a little bit about that. Uh, so it's regardless of their need and their outcomes, uh, they get the whole what we call welcoming committee of EMS. We have the same issue with emergency departments, so we transport patients to emergency department. It represents about 16 to 18 percent of their business, EMS does. Um, across the country in our studies. And um, remember when our patients go to the emergency department, it's, it's a high cost structure. It's a 24-hour service. And they have to be there at all times, just like yours. Uh, but they respond to a much higher volume patient. Uh, basically, it turns out, the emergency departments uh, don't admit everybody. It's a very low acuity model. And uh, there's a lot of uh, variation occurs, including a lot of overordering of tests. A lot of initiatives that aren't necessary, and I don't expect you to take that at face value, but we do a lot of work with emergency departments, and we find a lot of this. And also, to a true, very vast degree, it's episodic care. Think about that term. Episodic care means we're treating the symptoms and the needs of today, but it really doesn't necessarily respond to the overall patient's needs. So for example, now we'll talk about congestive heart failure. We'll talk about diabetes. The solution is not necessarily to get them worked up for the emergency care event. It's to look at their entire uh, care map, so to speak, or if you will, a look at case management. The mental health patient, the serial inebriate patient, they need more than what EMS and an emergency department can provide. They need a, to be wrapped with services to avoid, uh, to the extent possible, waste and more importantly, unnecessary need for services in the future. And then we have our trauma centers. And I'll be honest with you, when I say think MOI, that's mechanism of injury, you all recognize that term. We send a lot of resources for relatively modest symptoms. In fact, with a mechanism of injury, there are no symptoms, right? It's just about how badly the car was crashed and what have you. And really, when you look at the numbers, uh, the fact of the matter is that the yield on trauma triage to trauma center is very low. So uh, yeah, now, if you're the trauma patient, you don't think it's low. But the fact of the matter, we send everything. We freeze hospital activities when trauma occurs. And we have a lot of ancillary testing that sometimes has a very low yield. So we're moving away with ACA from a fee-based program to a value-based program. Fee-based to value-based. So today, small cues generate payment based on a an EMS transporting a patient, right? But in the future, we expect the value quotient to the value uh, driver to be more about what was the yield on these patients, and we'll pay you on those patients that really needed the service, the value, and the outcome was appropriate. Uh, so that's a big shift, and uh, the, this is one that you've got to ask yourself the question, are we on top of this one? What if our overall volume dropped dramatically, and yet we still have the same response time requirements? 
would we be ready to accept risk, basically, and accept risk based on the value driven as opposed to just responding to all the events? Many entities would say no. So value is really cost uh, divided by outcome in, in this uh, formula. All right, so Medicare, by the way, has been in this business for a while of looking at value, and they're already paying hospitals and physicians uh, more if they provide the value and provide the data, and less if they don't. In a, in a small way, but it's certainly a noticeable way, and it certainly got the hospital's attention. But we have been missed from that, and largely I think it's because, uh, we being the MS, because we today are not on the radar screen, but we are in the future. We do represent a large driver of costs. Maybe not we are not the costliest, but over time we generate a lot of the costs by, by nature of how we send our patients to emergency rooms and eventually they get admitted and what have you. So we look at this as nothing but a lot of people would freeze up and say, uh, people that are not on this call today, by the way, would say, oh my gosh, we, you know, we don't know what to do with this. And, you know, it's doom and gloom. And, uh, by the way, Medicare, when it was originally approved back in 65 or 64, was absolutely opposed by many doctors in this country. It just felt like it was government taking over. We hear a lot of that today with health reform. But the fact is, we look at it as a real opportunity to take precise data-driven models and implement them. And can we do that in EMS? We certainly can. Uh, so think cost-effective, think appropriate utilization, think of data-driven outcomes. All right, so where do we go from here? Well, you know, our feeling is, and I'm sorry, I passed over this just a little bit, conduct a baseline assessment in your system as to what your needs are, develop areas of opportunity, then build on those core strengths and, uh, and look at building the uh, opportunities uh, for improvement through an action plan. Now, we've been fortunate enough in the last uh, eight or nine months to work with a community called Santa Clara County EMS, which is actually south of San Francisco, California. San Jose is uh, one of their bigger cities. To work on a stakeholder-driven process to really rethink how EMS is being delivered in that community. And we're very close to having a final strategic plan developed for them. And the community has really embraced this process. We've had excellent stakeholders. And this is a little bit of a complicated chart. But the fact of the matter is, you can go to the Santa Clara County EMS agency's website and find these documents, the minutes of the meetings, and some of the presentations that have been made and see about their progress. So the question I ask you is, A, are you at the table at some of these events? Or more importantly, are you driving some of this thinking now that we would warrant it needs to occur now? You, can't, you, you can wait until it happens to do, then good luck being a resultant of that and uh, then having to take somebody else's rules and work with those, whether you be fire-based or private or not, or could you be in a position of power and begin to operate, such as Matt's program in, uh, in Fort Worth, and operate and direct some of these programs and really lead some of our providers and our health plan towards some of the successes that they're likely to achieve by your collaboration and working with them. So comprehensive planning is really a, an important key strategy. And why do we say that? Not because we as a consulting firm are in the business of comprehensive planning. It's the right thing to do. And it's mostly right because there's a lot of unknowns. So you need to really put numbers to paper and, and pe sharpen your pencils to look at what the impact's going to be and what the revenue impact's going to be and what other revenue sources can we use now to fund these more uh, innovative uh, programs that really take us not just out of the box or out of the bun, but literally out of our universe and, and think globally about what can be done in the future to help improve this and create that value-driven stream. So, you know, a lot of people talk about getting ahead of the power curve, and I'm not sure this slide's going to come up. There's a uh, little cartoon supposed to come up here. I burned myself on the end of the tunnel. This is an emergency department nurse, by the way. So, you know, there are a lot of fears about being too fast and too, you know, too off front there. But the fact of the matter is uh, that we do know that there are consequences of underemphasizing planning and processes. And part of that is, you know, speed is no importance if we don't really, truly travel in the right direction. And certainly this is one area that I would strongly encourage our audience to take, spend a lot of time on in the very near future in order to be able to drive some of these, uh, the directions of what and how you're going to be impacted in this uh, menu. 
So the other thing is about accountable care organizations. Should you play with them and should be part of them? And more importantly, do you even know what they are? And are, is there one in your community? And have you approached them? These are all opportunities. And remember, I'm telling you, you your services have been undervalued as the potential for helping create the partnerships that will help all these other providers, physicians and hospitals and outpatient clinics to be successful in health plans for that matter. And they don't know that yet. And, uh, and so I think those are important. The other thing is don't forget that a big part of ACA is really about compliance. And you think ambulances are under scrutiny now in this country as yes, they are? They're going to come under even more scrutiny as our hospitals and physicians in outpatient centers because compliance and therefore the lack of compliance and therefore the dollar savings of uh, uh, you know, returning revenue that should not have been spent or maybe have been fraudulently spent uh, you know, are going to come back to eat us and so we want to be really really careful about this arena as well and not lose our eye on the ball by strictly doing it through a planning made but get your compliance programs in order and make sure they're airtight. It's um, you know frankly hard work. It's not easy, and all of us are compromised. All of us are working hard, but this is one area that I think if you miss the boat in this one, you're likely to have some severe consequences that you, you're not going to be able to live with. Well, in 1962, she yawned and her nightmare began. The woman hasn't slept in 30 years. I love this. You know, it's just it's not that bad, okay, folks. You know, just calm down a little bit. I know I've sort of drawn a very you know, rough picture of what the future is. I just sit in my room and I pray to God for mercy. I love that. Uh, so here's a guy really, you know, he's, this is after health reform. He's an EMS provider there in, in uh, I'm not even going to name the state because I would typecast him, probably in my state of Michigan where I'm from. And uh, he's now living the easy life. Why? Because he, in fact, has progressively planned that EMS provider's involvement in a innovative set of programs for the community. I thank you very much for the attention on this portion of the presentation. Matt, I want to welcome you next to the uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Mike, and for everybody who's uh, had to uh, endure Mike's uh, uh, much like a fire hose, drinking from a fire hose, or to stand up, walk around a little bit, make sure that uh, you're able to endure the next uh, 30, 45 minutes that we're going to be going through this. And what, what my role here is today is to share with you what our team here at MedStar has been able to do over the course of essentially the last three, three and a half years that we've been working closely with our community to develop some of these um, integrated programs to work with our local community to get our programs in place. For those of you that don't aware, MedStar is a quasi-governmental entity. We're a public utility model, and you see the statistics up there on the screen. But suffice it to say that we are a very busy system. What's unique to some extent about our system is that we have tremendous community uh, collaboration. You'll notice that we have an emergency physicians advisory board that is made up of the emergency department physician directors of all of our emergency departments, plus representatives from the Tarrant County Medical Society. That external medical control oversight provides a forum for tremendous collaboration. So there are very few, if any, decisions that are made in our community as it relates to the provision of mobile health services that does not have the input and the approval by all of our hospital partners and the members of our medical society. So I would encourage many of you who are contemplating going down this road, make sure that this is a collaborative effort uh, that's worked on with all of your various stakeholders throughout the community. For those of you that are there, raise your hand if you truly believe that you are in the emergency medical services business. Those of us that have been doing this for a while, we always refer to ourselves as emergency medical services. We believe, and there's some growing uh, statistics to show, that really we are in the unscheduled medical services business. And you'll see a cartoon on the screen, and this is fairly typical of some of our patients in our local communities that use us for reasons that might not necessarily be emergency medical in nature. So we believe that we're in the unscheduled medical services business, and that's where, sort of where we're heading down the road. For anyone in our healthcare systems across the country, it is very difficult to navigate our healthcare system. Even for us as healthcare providers, sometimes it's hard for us to figure out where we fit in this hodgepodge of how care is delivered. When it's uncoordinated, it's, it's unscheduled, and it's difficult for us to find the right place to go. So some of the things that we find in this kind of state of unscheduled care, or uncoordinated care for that matter, 
is that about a third, a little more than a third of the patients in our community call 911 for really non-emergency types of calls, which goes down to this point of are we truly in the emergency medical business or are we in the unscheduled healthcare business? One of the challenges that we have with patients that use us or the emergency departments for primary care is that the emergency department becomes that source of primary care. So our medical director is Dr. Beeson. If we respond to a call and we ask a patient, who's your primary care physician, and they say Jeff Beeson, there's a problem with that. He should not be your primary care provider, but that may be the doctor he sees the most because that he's in the emergency department. We also have an issue in many of our communities where there's a malalignment of incentives. So we, have, we only get paid as ambulance providers if we transport someone to the hospital, which incentivizes us to transport, to use the highest cost of transport to the highest cost care setting. So we don't want to encourage that. It's also, quite frankly, the easiest. So for us, it's real easy to respond to a call, pick up someone, you call, we haul, and we take them to the emergency department. For many hospitals, and especially in the emergency departments, it's oftentimes easiest to admit the patient. So when the physician is seeing the patient in the ER, they refer the patient for admission. It goes to the hospitalist, and pretty much your, your hands are washed, and you're moving on to your next patient. And you know, in many cases, that um, is what happens with these patients. We've taught patients to use the system this way. People call 911 to see if they needed to, to see because it's what we've taught them to do. A lot of folks have spent a lot of uh, TV production dollars to teach folks that, gosh, you know, 911 is the way to go. For some folks, their doctors tell them to call 911. Raise your hand if you've been on a call where the patient says, oh, yeah, I called my doctor and he told me to call to call 911, or the receptionist told me to call 911. Um, we've got some folks here in the room who are actually raising their hand to that to that point. For some people, it truly is the only option. They don't have transportation. Well, I, you know, we believe that we just need to find a better solution for these folks, and we've been doing that here in Fort Worth. We have found, um, and some studies have shown, that many patients that are frequent users of the emergency department have a payer source. You'll see up on the screen a study that was published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine a few years ago that indicates that a lot of the frequent users of the emergency department have a payer source. One of the things you'll see highlighted is that they found that public insurance is overrepresented in that cohort, meaning that people with Medicare and Medicaid are typically ones that are going to the emergency department. This is important for us as a, as a barometer, if you will, because as Mike mentioned, more and more people are going to go into sort of the public insurance exchanges and those types of programs that have a low reimbursement for providers, um, and they're going to end up using the emergency care system more than people who don't have insurance today. And I don't know many people who could survive on, on the Medicaid rate or in many cases the Medicare rate for the services that we provide. So that's going to continue to provide an access issue. So if you're a physician and you're not willing to take Medicaid patients, or in some cases you're a clinic and not willing to take Medicare patients because the reimbursement is so low, we're going to continually see the patients that are quote unquote insured at this public rate uh, not able to get access to care because there aren't providers that are willing to provide it at that rate. One of the things that we look at over time is the change of our call volume. This is a report that we did a year ago that looked at the percentage of change in our call volume types over the last 10 years. For those of you that might be familiar with the uh, Clawson system, this kind of falls along the protocols, the 33 cards that are in that protocol set. But you'll see that the interfacility protocol or the interfacility card and the sick person card are the call types that are increasing the most rapidly in our, health, in our provision of mobile health services. If you look to the right on that slide, you'll see the call types that actually have had a percentage decrease, and some of the patients, I'm sorry, some of the calls that have had the largest decrease are the motor vehicle accidents and the breathing problems. What this tells us is that over time, the, the fastest growing part of our call volume are the low acuity types of calls, so we're really going to need to continually look at how do we deliver care to those lower acuity patients. I won't spend a lot of time on a lot of these things that in the next few slides, because Mike did a really good job of, of emphasizing uh, the whole sort of landscape that we're in, but I can't emphasize the, the concept of the satisfaction-based reimbursement. Um, if you pick up any medical trade journal, uh, any healthcare trade journal, you will see constantly articles in there about the whole pay for performance, and you'll see how that plays out for some of the hospitals here in a slide or two coming up. Because of that, you're seeing a new C-suite mem member. And this is the chief executive, I'm sorry, the chief experience officer. We have a new hospital that opened up in our community here recently, and they actually hired a, a director of patient experience in the hospital at the director level that came from the Marriott Corporation. They have hired chefs 
to work in the cafeteria that's going to be providing the patient um, meals because they recognize the fact that the experience of the patient is going to have a huge impact on the reimbursement. So we have to, as EMS providers or as mobile health care providers, have to continually look at our patient satisfaction and how we improve that and build customer service professionals in addition to health care professionals. Mike talked about the accountable care organizations. One of the interesting things that you're seeing, and I, I think that Bob might be on this call, but uh, Highmark Blue, Shield, Blue Cross and Blue Shield is actually going through a process where they are buying a hospital system, a health system. And you're going to see these integrated delivery systems evolving over time where hospitals, insurance companies, physician group practices all fall under one provider group because that's the most efficient way to provide that level of service. So in your local community, start looking at who are the drivers for that integration and how can you be a seat at the table and help them become part of that integrated delivery system. The value-based purchasing, about three weeks ago, Kaiser Health Foundation and CMS and others uh, released information on what hospitals are going to be um, bonused or penalized based on this value-based purchasing concept. Here's what it essentially looks like, um, and I'm going to jump two slides ahead here. So this is the spreadsheet that came out from CMS, and what you see here in the columns is the value-based purchasing percent. This is the percent of their Medicare reimbursement that they are either going to be bonused or penalized based on the value-based purchasing. Part of it is uh, on readmission as well, as you see there, but that total um, bonus or penalty on the far right-hand side is what these hospitals have at risk. So if you look at Glendale Memorial Hospital, those of you that are from Southern California, raise your hand. Uh, as soon as you're off this phone, if Glendale Memorial Hospital is in your service area, I'd be calling to make an appointment to go see them about how you might help them with their 1.32% reduction that they're getting in Medicare reimbursement. These are the types of discussion points that you can have with your hospital CEOs, your hospital CFOs, uh, and your case management folks, because I guarantee you that the uh, CEOs and the CFOs are really looking at this because for many hospitals that may be operating on a 2 or 3% margin in general, to have a 1.32% or a 0.87% hit on all your Medicare payments, not just the readmissions, but all of your Medicare payments, that becomes a big deal for those folks, and it's, it's keeping them up at night. One of the interesting things about the um, ACA, or PAPACA, is it's a lining incentive. So we have new partnerships being formed, and they're either going to survive or not survive based on those partnerships. Um, some of the things that you should be looking at down the road we talk about is EMS healthcare or is it public safety. I know we've got a very diverse group of folks on the webinar today, but uh, everybody knows for the most part that some of us are really proponents of the fact that we are in the healthcare business. Sometimes there's a public safety crossover, but we are primarily healthcare providers. But look at some of these statistics. 1.3 million healthcare jobs created um, since December 2007. 5.6 million will be created by 2020 as compared to 5.8 million lost in non-healthcare settings. And those of you that are in the, some public sector arenas and are facing layoffs and, re, and workforce reductions, um, it, you should be pushing for the fact that your healthcare provider is not going to become more involved in the healthcare system. A physician shortage, I want to focus on that. So if we're looking at, by 2025, there being about a 200,000 physician shortage in our community, how can we, as mobile health providers, step in to help fill that gap, fill that void in your local community, and partner with some of your local physician groups to help perhaps even deploy them more appropriately throughout the region. One of the interesting thing, and another interesting thing that we're seeing is this whole focus on employers becoming much more savvy in what they're purchasing for health insurance. So there's actually a group that's been organized called the Catalyst for Payment Reform. Interesting choice of acronyms there. And this whole focus, or the whole focus of this group, and they're small employers, as you see on the screen, they're like Walmart, Disney, Intel. These are large corporations that are at significant risk for expensive health insurance for their employees, and they're pushing for value-oriented payments. So they've approached Aetna, Humana, and United Healthcare to really start only paying for things that make a difference in patient outcomes on a performance basis. So you'll see there that Aetna is now paying the same for a C-section as they do for vaginal birth. C-sections are much more expensive. If you were to, uh, to approach a pregnant woman in your community and say, hey, when do you do? And they say, next Thursday at 2.15, well, that's probably because they have a C-section scheduled. It's much more expensive to do that. So Aetna has now come out and said, okay, we're going to pay X for a childbirth. If you choose to have a C-section, that's fine. 
the outcome of the C-section generally is no different than the vaginal birth. We're only going to pay for the, the cost of the vaginal birth. If you want the C-section, you pay the difference. Same for colonoscopies, all sorts of things. Another interesting dynamic is that large corporations like Darden Restaurants out in Orlando, Sears, they're going from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan for health insurance. So they're saying to their employees, we're going to get out of the health purchase, health care or the health insurance purchasing business, and we're going to provide you $14,000 a year that you can have to buy your own health insurance. Good luck with that, and let us know how it works. Because they don't want to be the financiers of this entire health care process or be the ones that have to, to a large extent, administer some of these programs. So be aware of that as, as we're moving down the road. One of the um, dynamics that's also happening is the insurance companies are obviously through case management and other things having a bigger say in some of the treatments that are being provided, but also the healthcare providers are having to compete. So we and our company have United Healthcare. United Healthcare provides us with an app. We have a high deductible plan. So the my doctor tells me, hey, you need to have an MRI. So I can look up the app on my phone and look to see in my region, in my my medical trade area, which MRI provider has the lowest cost MRI. So I can pick the $600 MRI, or I can pick the $2,000 MRI, but I'm writing the check, so I'm going to pick the one that's $600 as long as the imaging is such that the doctor can read it. Um, so you're going to see that coming down the road, and how are we going to respond as, as EMS or mobile healthcare providers to do that? One of the things that I just want to highlight on this particular slide is this whole concept of readmission, as we saw earlier, is a huge issue. We believe, and, and you'll see here in just a moment, that we've had a big impact on a lot of this uh, congestive heart failure readmission. It's gotten a lot of focus from CMS, a lot of focus from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and you'll see in the last bullet there that MedPAC has come out and estimated that $12 billion a year is spent by CMS for potentially preventable readmissions. So for those of you who are still on the public sector side, the public safety side, and looking at DHS dollars and other grant dollars that might be available, my perspective is I want to be able to tap into the $12 billion because I'll bet that with all of the other grant opportunity that's out there, it probably doesn't come close to $12 billion that we can tap into. And as you look at this slide, the this is all for that 30-day readmission. Imagine what it's costing our healthcare system for day 31 and beyond because a lot of those patients end up going back to the hospital. I'm going to skip over that slide. So now that Mike has done a great job of sort of painting the, the, the landscape and we've added a little bit to that, many people are thinking, gosh, we're at the intersection of doom and gloom. But we believe that in that intersection, there's great opportunity. We'll walk through you or through with you some of the things that we're doing here um, that is actually making a big difference in these patients' outcomes. We believe this is all about patient navigation. And these are some of the things we're going to talk to you about. And we're going to do it in the chronology of how a call actually comes in. So in June, we started a nurse triage program. This takes the alpha and omega calls, those of you that are used to the Claussen system, but those low acuity 911 calls, moves them to a triage nurse, and that triage nurse helps to um, get that patient seen somewhere other than an ambulance to the emergency department. We have found that roughly about 40% of the patients that get referred to the nurse do get that type of an outcome. We approached our local hospitals, and for those of you that are on this call because you want to figure out how to fund some of these things, we can share with you that we have our three of our four hospitals in our community are actually funding the cost of the nurse in our communication center. Um, and sort of traditionally, we thought initially selling this to the hospitals would be, hey, we're going to unclog your emergency departments, improve throughput. They, the hospital said, yeah, yeah, that's OK, and, and that's nice. But what our big issue is, is if these patients that are low acuity come to the emergency room, they're going to sit in the emergency room for three, four, five hours or more, only to be told, we don't you know, do toenails here. We don't do teeth here. We don't do whatever it is. Those patients are going to go home three days later, get a press gamey survey in the mail, and what do you think they're going to respond on that survey? They're going to get a low patient satisfaction score from that hospital. So from the hospital's perspective, if we keep those patients out of the ER, they don't get a press gamey survey. So they don't take a hit on those patients. And that's been the biggest sale for those hospitals because it's going to improve their patient satisfaction. We believe there's some growth uh, involved in this process for hospitals and physician telemedicine, all those types of things that now that you have nurses in your communication center, you can do very well. On this particular slide, you'll see some of the outcomes from this program from July 1st through September 30th. We avoided 125 ambulance trips to the emergency department. For the typical public payer, and we use this based on Medicare rates, you can see the cost savings there. So when you start talking to payers, and these were actually uh, patients that were diverted, you can start showing real cost savings. And we've been able to do that with some of our payers, some real cost savings for these patients moving forward. 
Many people have frequent flyers because we have the headquarters for American Airlines here. We didn't want to potentially piss off American Airlines, so we call these folks EMS loyalty program members. Um, these are patients that we proactively work with to get them connected to other sources for health care. So these are the folks we talked about earlier. Um, they, we can hopefully, hopefully enroll them in the indigent care program, get them connected with some of the clinics that are available, basically educating them on the things that are available in the community to help them not have to call 911. In one case, early on in this program, one patient didn't know how to get to their clinic, so we actually rode on the bus with that patient to show them how to get to their clinic and do other things. Um, again, this is a very, um, as Mike said earlier, local programs yield to local, local positive results. One of the things that I didn't mention earlier, but we will mention a couple of times throughout this, these are programs that work here in our community. You need to find in your local community those programs that meet your local need and bring a local benefit to your community. That's the only way these programs work well. We talked about our medical control board. Almost all of the programs that we're going to be talking about here were not only vetted through that, through that medical control authority and with our medical director, but actually came from a lot of those folks because they recognized the need way before we did. So that's what we do with some of these uh, uh, frequent flyer patients or EMS loyalty program patients, patients who are not successful by help, having us help them try and get care somewhere else goes into what we call a system abuser status. That is a status that is uh, designated by our medical control authority, by the medical director. We treat those patients differently. We don't do proactive home visits with them anymore. If they continue to use 911, the on-scene advanced practice paramedic can consult with the physician medical director on the phone to make a determination about what is the best outcome for that patient. It may or may not be going to the emergency department. You'll see some of the data that we have up on those screens, um, but I want to focus on this one here for just a second. You'll see that we've been able to avoid, uh, just in that group, about 104 ambulance transports to an emergency department. And again, that yields very specific cost savings that you can use to talk to your payer community about funding these types of programs. And, and those of you that are on the phone that I've talked to in the past and worked with in the past, there is some traction there. The next sc screen here shows uh, a Medicaid analysis that we did for our local Medicaid managed care contractor. So we're having discussions with them here in our local community about the fact that, gosh, you know, we've enrolled your patients into our community health programs or our CHF program, and here's their specific patient-by-patient -patient change in use of ambulance and emergency departments. Um, present this information to them and talk about doing a, a shared savings or a referral fee whatever the case might be, and we've actually gotten some traction with the folks. They came out and spent a day with our, with our team, both on the nurse triage side and on the community health side, um, to see it firsthand, and we're moving down the road having some discussions with them. Our CHF program has been by far one of our most successful programs. Again, this is a program that came to us from the medical community uh, about two years ago. We've refined it over time. What I can share with you currently is that this program has had right now um, since June, we revised this program fairly significantly in June. Since June, we've taken 21, pa I'm sorry, 15 patients into the program. These are patients that the case managers and the cardiologists in the community identified these patients as being at risk for readmission. We can, th those, that group of patients had 24 admissions uh, in the prior year since they've been enrolled in this program and during that 30-day readmission program. Only one patient out of those 15 has had to go back to the emergency department, and that was for a pacemaker failure. Um, so these patients have done exceptionally well in learning things like medication compliance, weight compliance, diet compliance. Uh, the community paramedics, the advanced practice paramedics meet with these patients on a regular basis, make sure that they're getting weighed, make sure they're taking the medications. There are some interventions available, including uh, the potential for adjusting PO diuretics or doing some in-home diuresis if those patients need it to serve as a bridge between the time that they um, get seen by our advanced practice paramedic and get to a, their regular primary care physician so that they avoid that emergency department admission or that readmission to the hospital. You'll see some of the, some of the data there I just shared with you, the, the most current data that we actually were told yesterday by our um, community health program coordinator. When you start attaching some dollars to that, you saw you saw one of the earlier slides that CMS pays about seventeen thousand five hundred dollars per CHF admission. So if you start putting some dollars to that, if we avoided these thirty-two uh, readmissions for those patients that we've monitored, now you start talking some real money. 
So we save Medicare about $16,000 per uh, patient that's enrolled in this program. So again, this is a very logical course of action as we're talking about accountable care organizations, at-risk bundled payments. Um, you can have some really good traction with payers in looking at some of these readmissions or at, with your hospitals. We talked about the hospitals earlier. Those folks are, are really paying attention to this readmission issue. If you can reduce those readmissions, it'll increase the payments that they receive from Medicare. Observational admission avoidance, this is another program that came to us from the community. Uh, this is a program where you go into the hospital emergency department, the ED doc thinks that, well, maybe we should keep you overnight because I'm not really comfortable sending you home. You're going to have a follow-up appointment tomorrow with your primary care physician or with a neurologist or with whoever it's going to be that you're going to meet with tomorrow. So we're going to hold you overnight to uh, just make sure that you're okay until you get to that appointment. Well, our local accountable care organization found that that's costing them about $5,000 per observational admission. And they came to us and said, hey, is, can we have these patients monitored by you guys overnight or for the weekend until they get back to their primary care physician? And can you help keep them safe at home? Um, maybe provide some episodic care if they get nervous during the night or during the weekend. So we've um, taken that program uh, in-house. And so far, this slide is a little bit older, but so far we've taken 16 patients into that program. Not one patient, not one patient has gone back to the emergency department, and all of them have actually one patient did go back. Um, but the other 16, none of them went back. And the um, accountable care organization gave us a report on these uh, original nine patients that we had in the program. It saved them $121,000 those nine patients, let me say that again, by them coming into our program, saved them $121,000. They paid us a pittance of that for a referral fee, which actually was still good for us because we got referral fees for these patients. Um, but they are willing to have conversations with us on sharing some of that cost savings with us um, to help align some of those incentives like we talked about earlier. I'm going to move ahead a little bit so we save enough time for questions and answers. Uh, this is the Observational Admission Avoidance Program. This is actually the report that they gave us. And, and if you look really close at your screen without pressing your nose against the screen, you'll see that $121,000 savings to them for those nine patients that they enrolled in the MedStar program during that time frame. Hospice verification, again, another community organization that came to us and said, hey, we've got this issue with patients who go home on hospice. And at the 11th hour, the last minute when the patient's going to pass through to the other side, the family gets nervous and calls 911. So working collaboratively, collaboratively with our medical control authority and with this organization, the hospice organization, we put together a program where they identify, the hospice organization identifies patients who are at risk for hospice revocation. We actually take those, pro those folks into our program. We do one home visit with them and the hospice nurse together to introduce the program to the patient. Here's a 10-digit number if you get nervous. Here's what you can call if you cannot get a hold of your hospice nurse. Obviously, hospice is still your first course of action, but if you can't get a hold of them, we will come out and see you. We also register those addresses in our computer-aided 911 dispatch system. So if the patient's family calls 911, the address is tagged. It comes up on the computer screen as one of our hospice patients. We send a regular response, but we also call the hospice nurse assigned to that patient, which is in the notes for that computer-aided dispatch entry. And we say to the nurse, hey, we're on the way out to John Doe's house. Uh, you might want to beat feet. We'll try and buy you some time. So the community paramedic co-responds with the ambulance when the community paramedic gets to the house, says to the family, hey, remember we sort of talked about this. Um, that's not what the patient wanted. Uh, is it OK? We're going to send the ambulance away. We're going to send the fire department away. I'm going to stay here with you uh, and wait for the hospice nurse to arrive. We're going to give the patient all the morphine that they need and all the Zofran that they need to make them comfortable. Uh, we'll medicate the family if necessary. Just kidding. Um, basically, just keep everybody calm until the hospice nurse gets there. Um, so far, we've taken 16 patients in total into that program. One patient had a revisit to the hospital. But even in that case, we were able to get that patient direct admitted from their hospice bed at home to the hospice bed in the hospital with no revocation of the hospice program. So the hospice agency is very happy with this program. They are paying us for this program, and it's saving them buku dollars. Um, You'll see some of the grand totals there. Now, we'll mention also that we've had the, the blessing to be able to go to a number of different groups to present information to. One of them was last year we went to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, gave a very good presentation to them, and showed all the statistics and all the utilization changes and the cost savings. And after we were done, one of the policy wonks and researchers from ARC raised his hand and said, 
how does the patient feel about all this? How's the patient satisfaction? And up until that point, we really hadn't gauged patient satisfaction because you know we we're, we're financial people, we're clinical people. We hadn't really looked at it that way, and we responded well. You know, we think that the patients like it because they send us a couple nice letters. One patient that um, did eventually die, um, not because of our program, but just died through the normal course of their disease. The family actually asked that instead of flowers, they make donations to the MedStar Community Health Program. So we think it's pretty well. But that was a clear indication to us, and it should be a clear indication to everybody on the webinar that patient satisfaction is a big deal. So develop tools. We have some that we're using here. Uh, there are some external tools. But figure out a way to start really gauging patient satisfaction so that you can present not only the changes in usage, but also how satisfied the patients were with the system. We also started using a patient assessment of health status program. That's a universal program developed in, in Europe, actually, that we can do pre or, or right when we enroll patients into these programs and then again after they graduate or even as part of that graduation criteria. So when the patient's enrolled in our, for example, in our congestive heart failure program, they may rate their health status as a 20 out of 100 and their ability to manage their health care uh, as a 20 out of, out of 100. At the end of the, the, uh, the course of care with us, after the end of that 30 days, they really reevaluate that and now they're at 80, 90 on that scale. So that now gives us the fact that not only do we save all of these admissions, save all this money, the patient satisfaction was through the roof, but also their comfort with managing their own health care increased 60, 70, 80 percent, whatever it was, over time. And that's very important for a lot of these folks. One of the things you should check into if you, don't, if you haven't yet is what uh, Mike had referenced, this whole disproportionate share process. Two states um, that I know of, Texas and California, have gone through this delivery system reform incentive payment program. It's a new approach at providing disproportionate share dollars. It essentially pays hospitals for innovative programs that meet the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim of improved care, improved health at reduced cost. And what we, we were approached by our local hospital. We actually have a program that's been uh, through most of the, the um, hurdles that ha it has to. Uh, and is close to being approved by CMS at this point, where the hospital system is going to pay us about $4 million over three years to, improve, to increase the ability for us to see more patients. So we'll have a lot more community health paramedics on the street, a lot more nurses in our communication center. We'll manage more patients and navigate them through the system. They're going to spend about that 3 to $4 million on us. They're going to draw down $11 million, but CMS has estimated that's going to save CMS about $26 million in health care expenditures. So we think that's a pretty good ratio, um, and we're glad that CMS is looking at, at this as one way to involve EMS more in this entire process. The innovation, the uh, um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality did profile uh, one of our programs. It's on their Innovation Exchange. Um, sometime in the next week or two, they're going to be publishing an update for that. That'll be out by February 1st, hopefully, uh, which is just a couple of days, so certainly in the month of February. So we'll, we'll share that with anybody who would like to see it. Um, but again, we've gotten the Fed's attention, and we would like to see more people get the Fed's attention as it relates to this. There's been some publications by the Rand Corporation and some other things. We, this is a, a note that um, when we presented to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, so we think the program is actually moving along quite well. In March, we have the opportunity, Dr. Beeston and myself and Doug Hooten, our executive director, and a few others are going to be doing some congressional briefings with um, Hill staffers um, and some updates for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So there's a lot of federal attention being paid to these programs. But again, even though that's happening nationally, we want to close with basically saying that there is huge opportunity for you folks in your local communities to find out what the gaps are in transitional care in your community find out a way to meet those needs, fill that gap, and the money will be there for you to be able to do that. We had to make some significant upfront investments. This is not an easy process. We have spent a lot of money, about $1.5 million over the last three years, in doing a proof of concept. We have a patient database that has 390 some odd patients in there that we've tracked very specifically through these programs, and we can now go to the payers, go to the hospitals, go to the cardiologists, and say with very significant specificity, this is what the program has meant to the patients, this is what it's meant to the payers, so how do we partner to make these programs continue down the road um, and help you, help us, or help us help you um, make the patients healthier, improve their experience, and reduce cost? Those are three things that need to become very much a part of your acumen because that 
triple aim from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement is what Medicare, Medicaid, your payers are all talking about. We, as urgent, I'm sorry, as unscheduled healthcare providers can have a significant impact on all three of those categories. There's some uh, helpful links for you there on the uh, additional resources. And Mike, at this point, I've exhausted my ability to speak anymore, so we'll open it up for anyone who has any questions or would like additional information. Thank you, Matt. Well, and thanks a lot, Matt. Mike. Juliana, back to you. Uh, thank you. Yes, it does appear that we have a couple of questions. And um, let's see. I'll just open those up uh, for the... Uh, The first question is, um, what drives unnecessary services? Malpractice risk? Will this process include legal li liability form? So Matt, I might start with that one. That, that sounds like a familiar question because I did a previous webinar on subject for all emergency providers, uh, EDs and, and trauma centers, and that came up. And so the notion of uh, at least uh, beyond the episodic uh, pre-hospital care, are there some risk? And, and the fact is, I think uh, what we're really calling for is, uh, you know, again, instead of the art of medicine, the science of medicine. So, and we know, and I, I know as an expert witness, uh, frequently we get asked, what are the standards of practice, what's been published? And, and so those are the kinds of things that, you know, healthcare is definitely gravitating for, has for a while, but now is really coming to a very keen, sharp sense of what's needed in the industry, which is really the level of precision, razor sharp precision on healthcare delivery. So the thing is when you put providers, let's just take emergency department providers, and you put them on a scale, uh, it turns out there's a lot of variability in who orders what tests and what order they order them in and, and um, and whether they're serial tests that are repeated and what have you. And again, that, that's variation. It can cause higher costs. And sometimes it does not deliver the outcomes we're really looking for. Matt, your comments? Yeah, I would add that what we have found um, from the liability and risk perspective is the way that we are delivering care to these patients now is very risky because it's uncoordinated care. They're getting multiple um, uh, uh, diagnostic tests are getting multiple prescriptions, they're getting multiple prescriptions filled, and by helping to coordinate that care, it's actually safer for the patient, um, and there are more people involved in that coordination of care. Now, what we've also uh, not mentioned so far is that our experience over the last three and a half years in doing this is very little of what we are doing in our community is any type of expanded scope of services. The services that we're providing are within the, the typical scope of practice for a paramedic. Even the LASIKs that we're administering at home is something that most places are doing on the ambulance. So there's really no expanded scope. It's just an expanded role of services. Now, you do need to check with your local state authority. You need to check with your local, um, whoever your, your attorneys are. Um, but what we have found is that the approach that we've taken, both with the nurse triage, with the community health program, the protocols are very conservative. They're very safe and in many cases have the backing not only of national or international organizations, but also your local medical control authority as well. You know, and I appreciate you mentioning that, Matt, because, uh, you know, we're all going to come across uh, potential barriers. And, and by the way, I think the question is an excellent question. Uh, but just as, as you assess the opportunities, you're going to come up with many reasons why you can get something done and move forward, but also many reasons why you can't. And they'll come from different sources. But, and there's some that have some fairly significant and, uh, and I would say, uh, stake up, uh, uh, stand up and take notice type of, like, scope of practice issues and, and, uh, and legislative liability protection and things of this nature. Uh, but those should be part of the planning process. And, it, in many respects, uh, getting your government entities involved in the potential lobbying and the uh, potential robustness of legislative and regulation uh, assistance that you're going to need to, because remember, most of that has been written in the past for traditional EMS care, and certainly on the healthcare side, and they may need to be rewritten. So some of these may have a longer horizon than others, and Matt's shown us many that have had you know, successes even in the relatively early uh, period of this reform business. And Mike, one thing I want to add to that is, um, you know, we use we use paramedics here, 
in some communities, you may find that you need to use nurses or you need to use some other type of mid-level practitioner. The goal is, again, what is the need? What is your ability to navigate patients? What is your ability to meet that transitional care need? And if you need to do it with, with nurses, if you need to do it with other types of care providers, um, you may need to reach out to some of those folks to partner with you so that everybody stays within a scope of practice that keeps Dr. Becker, for example, um, able to sleep at night. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Steve in San Antonio, Texas. He asks, what do you, either of you, foresee as far as re-educating the doctors and nurses that make the initial unneeded call for an ambulance, i.e. the infamous pre-scheduled transport? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, but if, if he's asking about the physician education, the other stakeholder education, we talked early on in the webinar about the need to collaborate with your stakeholders. So if, you're, um, if you have a medical control board, if you have a medical director who speaks doctor speak and, and he or she can help get a group of doctors together, a group of the ED docs together, um, whoever it is that needs to be part of the planning process or part of the implementation process, then education could clearly be part of that. Uh, when we started the training program for our community paramedics, we had a core program that was designed based on our initial effort to, to provide certain levels of services. As we found other community members coming to us asking us to do additional things, we created additional modules that not only included educating our community paramedics, but in many cases educating the community partner um, on how we operate. Did they did field rides with us. We did field rides with them. They spent time in our communication center. We spent time in their clinic. Um, that becomes a very crucial part of that. It, right before we got on this webinar, I was on a conference call with our, our local public hospital system and looking at care coordination between their case management department and some outreach in our community paramedics. So it's all about relationships and, and community collaboration to make sure that uh, everybody's providing services that are uh, appropriate, necessary, and that everybody feels comfortable in uh, navigating the patient through. Thank you. Um, Matt, another question for you. Is your program with advanced paramedics defined in Texas statute and regulations? This is Texas. And, and in, addition, <laughs> in addition to being the, the state that is red, as that you saw in that, that dollar expenditure, and we're red in a number of ways, um, Texas is a delegated practice state. So we are very fortunate in the fact there is no defined scope of practice for paramedics, EMTs uh, in our community. So Dr. Beeson is our medical director. If he decides that he doesn't want our paramedics to do anything other than transport people to the hospital, guess what? That's what we do. If he wants the paramedics to be able to do brain surgery in the field, well, as long as he provides the training, he can authorize us to do that. So you have to find out, again, in your local community, what is your ability to implement some of those programs within your scope of practice? Is there some ability to do that? Again, in Texas, we don't have that, that sort of limitation, if you will. Um, but I think many people who hide behind the fact that, well, you know, our state EMS office never let us do that, you probably need to ask the question. Because we've talked with state EMS officials uh, in a number of states who said, you know, that makes sense. We can get behind that. We can do it. It makes a lot of sense. And again, it goes back to that discussion of expanded role versus expanded scope. We've made the case, and, and I know that the, the far left coast and the far right coast, both perhaps geographically and politically, may have different perspectives on it. But a lot of what we're doing uh, really does not involve anything that's expanded skills for most of these paramedics, at least in our setting, which is a, an urban and a suburban setting. Rural setting may be a little different. And again, this goes back to finding your local need. Uh, if you're in a rural area where you, you, you're in Alaska, for example, I think we have a couple of folks from Alaska on the call, your community paramedic program, your mobile health care paramedic program might look totally different because your folks, you know, the best use of those resources might be training them to prescribe and do suturing. Um, and if that's what meets that local need, go for it. Very good. In fact, you answered another question that we had uh, reg regarding the impact on rural communities. Another question from Florida is, how do you measure the reduction of transports and ED visits? Is it compared to past practice of the patient? It is, and this is something that evolved over time. 
when we first started it, um, we looked at it one way, but now that we've been doing these programs for three years, we are able to take a 12-month look back on these patients. So Doug Hooten gets registered in our program today. We can go back because we're an exclusive provider and work with our hospitals and our data to say, okay, how many times did he get admitted to the hospital in the last 12 months? How many times did he call 911? How many times did he transported? And we assign a dollar value to that. So we know that he used 911 90 times last year and 89 times he went to the hospital and he had 89 admissions, whatever the case might be. We monitor that patient, or we monitor Doug through his 30, 60, 90 day enrollment in whatever program that it is here and we measure his use during that time frame. But then even after he graduates, we continue to monitor his use of 911, use of, of the ambulance and hospital admissions for the next 12 months um, so that we can really do a 12-month slice patient by patient, pre-enrollment, post-enrollment, and even during enrollment. Um, and that's really important. Defining how you're going to measure that um, can be the way that we just described, but also you need to talk to your local policymakers, your local payers, what data did they want to see? So we were talking with United Healthcare. They wanted to see some very specific data. Well, guess what? We generated it. Um, find out what your customer wants, what your payer wants, what your emergency department officials and your, your medical director want, and measure that and show it to them. Because that's what's going to be most important. Thank you. Um, another question we have is, it is my understanding that by a date certain time, medical providers will be required to prove the financial effectiveness of their models. Is this true? And if so, when will it be required? And does it currently include EMS? Yeah, maybe I can start with that, Matt. You may have some other intelligence. But uh, I know of no hard deadline. In fact, frankly, many of the regs and rules for health reform are still being written. Uh, there have been a number of changes in healthcare delivery that, uh, in payment particularly, that have already occurred, such as uh, uh, your children can be covered to 26 now, uh, uh, pre-existing conditions will have uh, left the cartel of options available to health plan, and eventually there'll be no lifetime limits so beginning next year on health plans, and many, many other uh, expenditures on some of these new uh, health exchanges in states has already occurred using federal dollars to create the high-risk exchanges that would be necessary to cover some of these patients. Uh, but there are no definitive dates on, on these pieces. But remember, some of these other arenas are already in play. So for example, you know, if you have a, uh, a readmission to the hospital, uh, I believe it's within 48 hours, Matt would be a little more familiar with that with a congestive heart failure, uh, there are going to be challenges getting paid for that under a Medicare or an eventually uh, potentially Medicaid model, depending on how the states react to it. Um, and um, that's happening today, so we're not necessarily waiting for reform. If, uh, if you don't meet uh, the data requirements for an emergency department for the 13 quality indicators that are required now for emergency departments, uh, as of uh, this year, you're being penalized uh, one to possibly as much as 2% on your payments and, until you provide that data, which are all, many of which are key performance indicators, and eventually they'll take it to the next step and say, okay, well, here are the expectations for that data. You should be under X hours or what have you, and that's all being done collaboratively. But there are no hardened dates and certainly nothing that would be universal covering everybody at once. And Mike, I would echo that. One of the things that has been very challenging through all of these changes is the amount of chatter that's going on in a number of different communities. Uh, one of the things that the, the person who asked the question might be sort of referring to, Mike, is that you know we've got the essentially four different types of ACOs now, and one of those ACOs is a shared savings model. And for, to be eligible for the shared savings model, you do need to be able to show very specifically where you're going to gain those economic efficiencies, where you're going to gain those quality efficiencies in order to be eligible for uh, the percentage of the savings that Medicare is going to benefit from over the course of that patient's course of care. So um, my encouragement to anybody who's on the webinar is to try and pay attention to what's happening, but more importantly, really work with your local community to find out what they believe would be a valuable service that you can provide for them and how can you provide it in a, in a way that makes a difference to the patient and to the other customers. Thank you. Uh, Matt, an, another question for you. In regards to community health programs, how do you set yourself apart from home health care? 
Um, we don't. We actually encourage people, if they have home health available, we want those patients in home health care programs. We are not a home care agency. We don't want to be in the home health business. The home health industry is about to go through a, a very significant utilization and review by Medicare. Uh, if the patient has that benefit available, we actually refer patients to them. When we started this process back in 09 and 10, we brought the home health community into our discussions so that they would understand that we're not looking to compete with them. We're looking to augment the services that they provide or serve as that gap between the time the patient goes home from the hospital and can have their home health visit for the first time. In some cases, that could be 24 or 48 hours. What we have found by being ecumenical and by being um, transparent with the discussion is some of those home health agency CEOs have come back to us and said, you know, we like the partnership. Um, we have an issue. And our issue is that it costs us a lot of money to have a nurse on call and go out and see somebody at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. Is that something that maybe we can contract with you guys to do? And if we have an episodic need on the weekend, can you guys go out and see that patient, maybe call the nurse or call the doctor or call whomever um, and help us with that? And by the way, if you're willing to do that, we might be willing to pay you for that. Or we will be willing to pay you for that because it's less expensive than us having the nurse go out. Um, again, another opportunity is that for many people on the call who have responded to those calls where the home health nurse is on the scene and you guys get on the scene and say, really? You called 911 for this or you called us for this? Um, one of the home care agencies have asked if we would be willing in the future to be a second opinion for them. So they've got a home health nurse on the scene with a patient, and that home health nurse thinks the patient needs to go to the hospital. The home health agency is getting evaluated and reimbursed and, and, and dinged, to use a common term, if they have a high readmission rate as well. So they have asked us, would you be willing to come out and give a second opinion? Do you think this patient really needs to go back to the hospital or not? Again, partner with your local community, all your stakeholders, and you will find opportunities that you had no idea existed, and that's quite frankly what we're seeing here in our community. Thank you, um, and I believe this is a, the, our final question today will be for both of you. Current funding of a new system would be mostly from hospitals incentivized to decrease hospital readmissions and ED visits. As hospitals' budgets become tighter, do you see the funding stream changing in the future? Well, let me start with that, Matt, and certainly very value, value your, uh, your thoughts as well. Well, first of all, uh, we do know that today hospitals are largely driven on their payment model, their charge model, how they charge, on a cost-shifting model, which is basically, and this is healthcare providers in general, uh, but in particularly the emergency care providers, for shifting uh, the uninsured cost towards those that are insured. It's just by sheer nature that when you have uninsured and you're, there, there's no source of payment, that the payers have to pay what's not being paid. They have to, otherwise we wouldn't have the healthcare delivery system. So a big need to do that shifting is going to change and there's going to be an expectation in addition to all that that uh, there'll be some cost reductions associated with all the other initiatives that are going on including the best practices that are encouraged so uh, that that whole piece is I think underway and really being an underlying tenant for the entire healthcare uh, movement. And, and my great great points I would add also that you have really three main customers here the hospitals are one, so the hospitals may be willing to provide some funding, and I'll share that um, hospitals like North Shore, Long Island Jewish, I think Jonathan's actually on the call, um, Presbyterian Healthcare System in New Mexico, other places have really taken a bold step to investing in outpatient patient navigation because they don't want that patient in the hospital. Um, it's more cost effective for them to manage that patient in an outpatient setting than it is in, inpatient. As hospital revenue streams change, either being incentivized to reduce costs, uh, you name it, bundle payments. They're going to be looking towards people like us, mobile health care providers, to help them. So as the revenue stream gets tighter and tighter for hospitals, they're going to be looking to other innovative ideas more and more. The, the second concept is that the second customer is the payer. So even though the hospitals may be the ones that want to work with you to fund a 30-day readmission prevention program, the customer for day 31 and beyond becomes the payer because now the payer is the one with the skin in the game. 
So market your services and develop programs that meet both of those needs. So for the first 30 days of enrollment in some of your programs, it's the hospital paying for that. Day 31 and beyond, it's, it's the, the payer, the, the insurance company paying for that. If it's a nurse triage program, it's both that would be willing to help pay for that because the hospitals don't want to have those uh, angry patients in the emergency department and the payers want those patients to go somewhere that's more cost effective and a better care coordination than getting an ambulance to the ER. Uh, again, opportunities, quite frankly, are limitless when you look at who the potential customers and beneficiaries are for programs like this. Excellent. Thank you all very much for attending our webinar today. We really appreciate your attendance. Uh, we will be making this available along with the slide deck on the Aberyst Group's website in the near future. I'll be sending you an email letting you know when it is available so you can pass it along to your colleagues. Thank you all very much for attending the webinar today. It was our pleasure to have you. Goodbye. <laughs>